has done a lot of work on the area I remember starting from real-time operating systems to networking to uh, point of service to wireless and now uh, security privacy and now these uh, mobile phones. So let's, without ado, let's welcome Professor Chen. Okay. Thank you very much. Is this on? Okay, great. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, uh, what I'd like to share with you today is just a small project we started about, uh, I would say, two years ago. <coughs> uh, when my student said, uh, wow, we got to save but sort of energy consumption in smartphone. And uh, <coughs> I said, yeah, sure. So we do what technique? Well, we, we got to use uh, the dynamic 4TG or frequency scaling. So why are you doing this? And this is a bit into that, including by me and the uh, Jillian others. <coughs> so I tried to discourage him. And uh, we, we are talking all this uh, fundamental restriction imposed by the uh, Nyquist Shannon sampling film and all that. And later we realized that there is a really cool, cool idea, both uh, theoretically and uh, practically. So we kept on working on, and we came up with a nice, nice solution analytically. And also we did a low-level detailed simulation. <coughs> and also we implemented and measured. And uh, by the way, if it's only a 5 10% improvement, I would say it's a non-problem, we shouldn't do it, although it depends. And it turns out to be a, this uh, resulted the significant savings, like extending your cell phone battery life by 54% on average. And uh, how you do that? <coughs> uh, this is a well-focused talk, it's not genetic talk, uh, but I will try to share this idea with you uh, as uh, sort of the easy uh, as possible. Oops. <coughs> okay, the, uh, as you know, uh, when you have mobile devices like this, or tablets, or even laptop, uh, I think the standard way of connecting to internet is Wi-Fi. And if you look at the <coughs> Wi-Fi map of San Francisco and New York City, uh, it, it is really dense. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, all these uh, red dots in a small town like Ann Arbor. There are so many uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots or access points. And in the US, in particular, you see a lot of uh, open access points. You don't need to have a password, all that. Although, I guess if you go to Europe, I found that there are fewer open access points, or there are lots of access points. I, I don't know why, but in general, that's what it is. <coughs> well, <coughs> the, because of this, uh, all these uh, mobile devices uh, and <coughs> the users expect to have uh, constant connection to internet uh, for uh, job related, or uh, your personal sort of <coughs> matters. And <coughs> the, uh, we try to figure out uh, what is the main sort of a problem with these mobile devices. And often I think the, uh, this uh, battery power is the main thing, mainly because you are putting a lot of things on these mobile devices. And I was visiting Korea <coughs> last December, and I was having dinner with uh, a corporation executive. He showed me the, uh, the phone, uh, which is about the twice of this size, and has all kinds of things. And also he showed me another one from his right pocket, carrying another battery pack. He said, why are you doing that? Well, you know, I can't use this all day long. And without this, I can't function as uh, the company's executive. So I always carry another pack. And <coughs> that reminded me, uh, in fact, this is iPhone. It doesn't look like iPhone, right? What, what it is is I have a power skin. This carries an extra battery. Without this battery, uh, 
usually I lose power in the mid afternoon. Although I don't use much, but I keep this Wi-Fi on all the time. The reason is that we have very good Wi-Fi connection in the department, but inside the building, <coughs> the, the, the cell phone connection is pretty bad. Uh, broadband com communication really bad. <coughs> and so I want to sort of stay in touch with uh, the internet, sending and receiving email messages or whatever, sometimes I browse web, but not, not all the time. Uh, in general, the, uh, the reason why these uh, mobile devices are sort of consuming power very quickly is because of uh, Wi-Fi. And another one is a GPS for location services. Of course, inside the building, GPS doesn't work well anyway, but Wi-Fi does. So uh, we checked how much of the Wi-Fi really consuming power compared to this broadband communication. And in general, I think it's about 14 times more power consumption than broadband like GSM. And the, uh, in fact, the, uh, most of uh, these uh, smartphone users uh, use perhaps the uh, less than 10% of the time for sending and receiving messages, but you keep this in your pocket or uh, your you know, backpack or you know, <coughs> whatever, your purse. And uh, these uh, smartphones or Wi-Fi uh, does all the things even if you don't do anything. And according to statistics, about 80% uh, of the users use less than 10% of the time for active transmission or reception of information using your mobile device. Meaning that the 90% uh, of the time, uh, your the mobile device is in uh, idle mode. And how this <coughs> Wi-Fi works? Uh, essentially, it is based on this CSMA, in other words, listen before talk, and also <coughs> uh, what it does, it will sort of constantly uh, sort of hear uh, these beacon signals from access points, and then these <coughs> the uh, beacon signal carries certain information, uh, then make sure it is for you, then you are supposed to grab it in a time manner. I'm gonna get to <coughs> uh, the details of this in a minute. Uh, in general, we found that uh, even if your Wi-Fi transmit and receiver is in idle mode, they are consuming about the same amount of power as active transmission of, and the reception. <coughs> Because of that, uh, you are consuming a lot of power even if you use less than 10% of the time. And in fact, the uh, all components of a Wi-Fi, both analog and digital, <coughs> are awake and operate at full operating frequency even in either listening mode. That is uh, one of the problems. Uh, obviously, I showed some of uh, the components of this uh, Wi-Fi including the analog part <coughs> and uh, you sample these analog signals and deliver the samples to CPU and the CPU process the sample, all that. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, essentially the, uh, what I'm trying to allude to you is that uh, the main culprit of the power consumption of Wi-Fi is idle listening. And the last is sort of the <coughs> analyze uh, how this problem is handled. Well, obviously we use a power saving mode, which is uh, a crux of scheduling slip. In other words, you want to make these uh, transmit and receive circuits in slip mode, and therefore you <coughs> consume power uh, as little as possible. But this is, uh, these must follow the following sort of a protocol here. You have an access point and client, client's mobile device, and the access point will transmit beacon signal <coughs> uh, periodically. 
and then this client must fully awake and hear this beacon signal. And by the way, this beacon signal may contain information saying that uh, you may have some data available and you should get it. Once you sense this information and say he, this uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, access point or beacon signal indicates, say, Khan, you might have uh, the data waiting for you. I have to understand that my name is being called and also understand that I may have a data in the access point. If I do send, I'll say, get me that data. Well, you cannot access, you cannot tell this the uh, to access point right away. I have to go through usual sort of uh, the channel contention and <clears throat> go through all this process and eventually I deliver that to access point. Access point or acknowledge, say, I got your request. You have to send that information. <clears throat> and then this access point will deliver this data, but not immediately because access point may be serving large number of mobile devices. And depending on number of devices, there will be a certain amount of queuing delay. And then eventually the data will be sent to this mobile device. And once the mobile device receives this data, and they will send the acknowledgement. And then you're done. After that, you have nothing else to do, so you can sleep for the rest of the interval of these <coughs> beacons. And actually, you can sleep only at this time period until and from this point to this point, you have to operate your circuit at full operating frequency. Otherwise, you won't be able to uh, recognize that your name is being called and then send this <coughs> message to the access point and uh, get the data. All right. <coughs> this is sleep scheduling. This sleep scheduling obviously the saves power because uh, you are reducing unnecessary sort of the idle listening. Now the question is, is this enough? Our answer is not. What we did, we analyzed <coughs> actual the Wi-Fi packet traces collected from major conferences uh, like ACM, CCOM. Uh, there is a repository of these traces at Dartmouth University. And we sort of plotted this cumulative distribution, uh, distribution functions for uh, <coughs> the percentage of time and energy spent in either listening mode. Uh, as you can see, <coughs> Uh, about say 10% of the time, the more than 90% no, of the users uh, will be in either listening mode. I'm, I'm sorry, the, <coughs> the actual the transmission and the reception. That means that most of the time uh, is uh, sleeping. And you can uh, look at the actual the percentage of uh, the energy spent on transmission or reception versus uh, the either listening mode. Again, here you can see a uh, large percentage of uh, <coughs> the uh, energy spent on either listening mode, even with this uh, sleep scheduling, because all these uh, Wi-Fi devices uh, are implemented with the sleep scheduling that I mentioned. What I'm saying is that with this uh, sleep scheduling, still the either uh, listening mode uh, dominates the uh, <coughs> energy consumption. The fundamental question, though, in that case, can we do better? This is somebody. And of course, uh, why it is, I already explained. Uh, <coughs> first, you have to the, uh, you know, contend for the use of a channel and the queuing delays, all this. 
So what we decide to look at, uh, this uh, sleep scheduling uh, is nothing but reducing the amount of time in either listening mode, as I showed you earlier. But it doesn't do anything about the reduction of uh, the amount of power used for <coughs> the process that I had when access point calls my name, I have to use a full frequency to detect it. And therefore, I have to use a full power. Okay, this is done by sleep schedule. So what we decide to do is, while this uh, power saving mode did the best to reduce the amount of time in uh, <coughs> the either listening mode, now I want to reduce the amount of power to be consumed in either listening mode. Well, why are you doing that? Well, <coughs> essentially we know that the actual power consumption is a proportional to uh, operating frequency. And uh, in order to reduce the power consumption, what we want to do is that we want to operate our the uh, Wi-Fi circuit at much lower frequency than uh, it is done. For example, I can down clock this uh, Wi-Fi circuit by a factor of four, factor of eight, or 16. Then I will reduce power consumption by factor of four, eight, or 16. Although it's not going to be exactly that proportional because there are other circuit components. So key idea, what <coughs> you know, we have in this, in this technique is that the existing sort of a solution uses a constant clock rate, whether you're in either listening mode or uh, receiving or sending packets, as you can see. But this uh, Emily's case, uh, we want to uh, slow down the clock in either listening mode, but we're gonna run our circuit at full operating frequency for reception and transmission of packets. Since, as I showed you earlier, uh, your Wi-Fi device will spend most of the time in either listening mode, you will be able to save the power significantly. That's the key idea. But, <coughs> Uh, let, me, let me do one more thing. Before doing that, uh, we try to figure out how much power we're going to save by down clocking this uh, Wi Fi circuit. And we tried this with uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Wi Fi, and the other one is a US, USRP. A wi Fi case, if you down clock by, say, factor of four, uh, it's not really reducing to 25%, but reducing to 50%. And also try this uh, with the USRP, the software defined radio. Uh, you don't save as much, but you save still significantly by down clocking. In other words, we want to convince ourselves uh, that down clocking indeed will allow us to have a significant power savings. And then we will try to figure out how to do it. Okay, <clears throat> the key challenge for this down clocking uh, the Wi-Fi circuits is the limitation imposed by Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem. As all you know, in order to reconstruct a signal you received, you have to sample receive the signal at least at twice the bandwidth the signal was generated by the transmitter. That means that the, uh, you have to sample this uh, receive the signal at about same frequency that transmitter used in generating the signal. In other words, if you turn clock <coughs> your receiving circuitry, you won't be able to decode the signal that you are supposed to decode and uh, take a proper action. Access point uh, will call me by padding special preamble. 
And if I don't decode that preamble correctly, I will, know, I will not be able to know that I am being called. And therefore, even if there is a message for me, I won't be able to decode, I won't be able to do anything. So only thing is I have to fully awake and then decode or recognize that my name is being called and then receive the entire data and decode it. That's what the, so the power saving mode does. And we want to overcome this sort of restriction. So how do you do that? In other words, that the, you are sleeping or fast asleep in the middle of the night. Somebody is calling you. Without waking up, you recognize that your name is being called. And therefore, you will you will <coughs> sort of consume much less energy. That's the idea. Well, what we what we did, we did two things. First, I want to separate this uh, detection from decoding. In other words, I want to be able to recognize that my name being called is uh, separate from uh, understanding actual data that I received. That's the first step. Second step uh, is for the recognition of this preamble. I want to do this in subconscious mode, or rather in town clock mode. How do you do that? Well, uh, I have my name, and the transmitter will generate special preamble by <coughs> sending or calling my name multiple times. It was Kong, 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 multiple times. And then even if I'm, I'm in sleep, I may, not, I may be able to hear it. How? I calculate self-correlation of these uh, redundant sort of transmissions. In fact, if you do that, you will be able to <coughs> detect uh, this uh, preamble with the same accuracy as you would have detected when you operate your circuit at full operating frequency. Okay, so let me give you more details here. I've listening mode, uh, you know, when there is a beacon signal, you are, you are supposed to have uh, the preamble first and then the uh, 8 to 11 packet. And I want to <coughs> recognize this part uh, without sort of a restriction imposed by my Christian Shannon sampling theorem. And we <coughs> came up with uh, the sampling rate independent or invariant detection mechanism, I already mentioned, uh, by uh, transmitting uh, perhaps the C copies of the uh, same random sequence. In order to do that, you have to generate special sort of a preamble in addition to a regular preamble. <coughs> so we are designing a additional new preamble we call the M preamble. That is a sort of a, the C duplicate the copies of a random sequence. Random sequence is your address. Uh, how to generate this, by the way, uh, later on I'll mention uh, how to implement this and deploy this in real world is that when you go to a new sort of area, then you detect these access points of beacon signal and then you want to establish association. When you build this association, access point may assign you a particular address or a random sequence. And so you will be Jodo when you receive my service. And I become Jodo. And whatever the messages I receive from access point, always it will have a Jodo in front. And once I detect Jodo, ah, that's for me. But I want to detect that uh, in subconscious mode. That's the idea. 
And then this transmitter must generate this special sort of the <coughs> uh, preamble for Jodo by having the C copies of a random sequence uh, corresponding to Jodo. And the, uh, how to detect these in subconscious mode? You calculate sort of a self-correlation of these C copies of a random sequence. If you do that, <coughs> in fact, the, uh, this uh, self-correlation, uh, actually this duplicate will uh, stay similar even if you operate receiving circuit at much lower clock frequency. And in fact, because of that, uh, the result or the recognition of these uh, C copies of redundant sequence would be uh, resilient to actual sampling frequency. <coughs> Here's a basic rule. Basic rule, uh, if you calculate self-correlation, that would be corresponding to a signal's energy approximately. And uh, depending on noise, if the environment is very noisy, this self-correlation won't help much. So you have to have a, sort of a minimum the detectable signal-to-noise ratio. And in fact, the, uh, if you calculate the ratio of uh, the average signal <coughs> energy to the noise flow, that should be greater than uh, this uh, minimum detectable signal to noise ratio. I'm talking about a single, single copy. But if you do uh, <coughs> multiple times, you will have <coughs> uh, this kind of uh, the enhancement. In other words, uh, uh, you will be able to sort of uh, detect this and preamble. Uh, with accuracy closely related to actual length of this M preamble. The longer, the better. And these are actual the measurement results we have. I'm not going to give details on this. All right, <clears throat> there are the problems though. There are several the, the engineering or implementation problems. One is, the, uh, if you don't sort of the assign this address very carefully, a uh, large number of uh, the receivers may be triggered incorrectly. In other words, uh, it is not for me, but somehow I will misunderstand that as me. In other words, there must be sort of enough separation between these M preambles. Otherwise, I may be incorrectly triggered by the preamble designed for someone else. In that case, I'm going to just waste energy because I wasn't called, but I thought it, you know, it was me and I, I will wake up. So that means uh, you have to have uh, <coughs> uh, particular the address, a physical address, or this uh, random sequence allocated. Uh, with enough separation. So <clears throat> what we did, uh, we used sort of the uh, separation between these, the uh, random sequences as node address as uh, large as necessary. For example, say node zero, uh, we have uh, no separation. But node one case, you have uh, so one symbol separation like this. Node two, we have two symbol separations. Well, this means that you're going to have a much longer sort of M preamble. That will incur overhead. I'm going to analyze this overhead as well. Especially if you have a large number of mobile devices to serve on the one access point, then I think these, uh, the sequence length will be getting much longer. So what we want to do is that we want to <coughs> uh, handle that problem by address sharing. How to share? Well, <coughs> we want to sort of allocate same address to multiple mobile devices. If these mobile devices 
are not uh, <coughs> using this channel very frequently because in that case, the probability of uh, two mobile clients with the same uh, <coughs> uh, same this random sequence uh, will use the channel at the same time will be very low. In that case, we are going to allocate same uh, <coughs> sort of the random sequence. And uh, what is the uh, optimal this physical address sharing? Uh, was uh, formulated as an uh, integer programming problem. And we solved this uh, using some approximation because this is an NP-complete problem anyway. And uh, we're not claiming any sort of a contribution on this. We're just solving real problem. Another one is a switching overhead when you down clock uh, from say <coughs> 10 megahertz to uh, say five megahertz uh, or, or one megahertz. Uh, when you switch these, uh, the frequency, isn't it incurring overhead? Yes. Uh, actually, switching <coughs> the transient period ranges from 9.5 to 151 microseconds for uh, the prominent Wi-Fi the implementations. In fact, if there is a packet transmitted during this uh, transition period, the packet will be lost. This uh, makes you wonder when to down clock. If you down clock uh, when packet is uh, transmitted to you, that packet will be lost. So how do you deal with <coughs> these uh, sort of the loss event? Uh, <coughs> we used sort of opportunistic down clocking. Uh, meaning that uh, if it's unlikely for you to receive a packet, then I can down clock. If it's likely for you to receive a packet, I won't down clock. How do you know this uh, likelihood or unlikelihood? Well, if you look at the Wi-Fi, the first one, there is more of a deterministic <laughs> packet arrival, such as uh, <coughs> these RTS, CTS. <coughs> if you receive RTS, CTS will follow very soon. If you receive a CTS, data will follow very soon and you're supposed to acknowledge. So this is a deterministic sequence. So once I receive RTS, I will not down clock because the CTS is coming to me. So this is very easy, right? Uh, wh what about <coughs> sort of the uh, non-deterministic packet arrivals? Uh, we applied just the similar technique as uh, branch prediction in architecture. Essentially, we have a small window. <coughs> you know, you slot it a time window. This window size is two or four, whatever you can have. And if in the most recent window, this window is a slide window, most recent window, if there was the outage event, in other words, there was a packet transmission, I didn't know, and I down clock, I lost it. Uh, you can detect this, by the way. It's not that hard. If that happened in the most recent window, I'm not going to down clock. If there was no outage event, I'm going to down clock. So this is opportunistic sort of down clocking. <coughs> the next question is, well, since this power saving mode is dominant and all Wi-Fi devices have this, uh, how do you integrate this email protocol with existing the Wi-Fi implementation or protocol. That's very simple. All we have to do is introduce one additional state, down clock to idle listening, and then transition to this down clock to idle listening uh, can take place from receiving mode or transmitting mode. I explained to you the opportunistic down clocking. If you do down clocking, you go to this down clock either listening mode. If not, then you go to 
usual the idle listening mode. And trans transmit from transmission mode, moving to idle listening or time clock idle listening mode is exactly the same way. <coughs> and then there's a transition, by the way, from uh, idle listening mode, uh, you may have to receive mode, go to receive mode, or transmission mode. Uh, the uh, receive mode case that uh, you use uh, this, uh, the uh, sampling rate invariant detection. In other words, uh, you are receiving same things in subconscious mode to uh, detect that your name is being called. That's what this means. And uh, down clock the uh, <coughs> either listening mode to the uh, transmission mode case, uh, you have to uh, <coughs> use this opportunistic sort of a down clocking as transition. All right, uh, I think I gave you almost all the key ideas incorporated in this email. The, uh, you have to talk about the deployment. Can this uh, coexist with uh, uh, legacy Wi-Fi? Answer is yes. Uh, Email nodes can detect the uh, existence of uh, legacy nodes through simple energy detection, uh, or uh, if you can decode uh, legacy preamble, yes, you can. All we do is we just prepended this M preamble on top of existing preamble and uh, the 8 to the 11 packets. And if you perform energy detection, I think you will be able to uh, sort of see uh, the existence of uh, the uh, legacy nodes. The other round, can legacy node detect the EMU <coughs> node? Yes, you can do that through uh, this energy detection again. So there isn't much of a problem. Uh, what about the virtual carrier sensing? This virtual carrier sensing is used to deal with the hidden node terminal problems. And also you're supposed to say you are going to uh, take say X milliseconds to transmit uh, next time. You are supposed to pad that in. And in fact, the, uh, the SICCOM 2009 paper uh, says this hidden terminal problem rarely occurs. And therefore, a uh, large number of uh, these uh, Wi-Fi cars uh, turned these uh, virtual carrier sensing off as a default. In that case, we don't have to worry about it. But if you turn on, uh, then you have to be able to handle this, or the current version we didn't handle. Uh, but you, know, you, you can add additional field that will carry a so packet duration. In that case, it's going to make your, the M preamble longer, unfortunately. But you know, since this is very infrequent, again, we're going to turn this off in default mode, and we're going to turn this back on only when we have to deal with uh, this uh, virtual carrier sensing. So you can handle that. Another one is uh, what kind of modifications do you have to make in order to make this email work? You have to look at these uh, from both access point, that's transmitter point. The other one is a uh, mobile device side. Well, access point case, uh, first of all, you have to prepend this M preamble to each and every these, <coughs> the 8 or 12, 11 packet that access point will send to mobile devices. That should be done in firmware. Usually, I think that the uh, users cannot do. And this firmware means that you can change the content of uh, this chip, or if you want to have a uh, dedicated chip realizing the function in the firmware, you can do that too. So this could be chip manufacturer's job or system integrator's job if they receive a programmable uh, this uh, Wi-Fi chip, they can program by integrator, I mean cell phone manufacturers 
like Nokia, Samsung, or Motorola. Actually, <coughs> Apple should be part of it. And until then, is uh, you have to change the uh, software device driver uh, because access point must allocate address to each and every mobile established association with it. Uh, that's very easy. What about mobile device, mobile client case? Well, mobile client case, the, uh, when it receives M preamble, it should be able to detect it. And also, it should be able to generate that tool. So you have to have the sampling rate independent detection algorithm. Uh, that should be implemented in firmware. Again, you can implement this with a special hardware instead of firmware. And but also, the, uh, the device driver must be changed to receive this physical address allocated by access point. So this is what we have to do in order to deploy this. And how good is this? Uh, we <coughs> evaluated these uh, all interesting angles. First, uh, can this mobile device detect the packet destined for itself in subconscious mode with what accuracy? If it detects uh, this M preamble uh, with uh, very low probability, this ain't gonna work. So we want to sort of evaluate this uh, by implementing this <coughs> sampling rate independent or invariant detection algorithm. Well, since we cannot change the actual cell phone's formula, as I said, the manufacturer can change, not me. What we did, uh, we did the uh, FPJ program on USRP, and we implemented and evaluated, actually measured. And the other one, <coughs> we want to evaluate how much energy you are saving based on real-world network traces. Uh, as I said, statistically, uh, about more than 80% of users use uh, less than 10% of the time uh, for transmission and reception of a uh, so a packet. But there could be a very few people using this iPhone or Android phone uh, to send, receive messages or calling all the time. If you happen to be a salesperson, you may do that all the time. For those individuals, I don't think the, uh, any technology will save power or save energy because you are constantly using your device. And uh, what do you expect? You expect to consume all, all the energy in the battery. But you know, somebody like myself, I have uh, meetings, classes. I simply don't have time to make calls and read emails all the time. So in my case, I would use uh, less than 10% of my time. And this technology is for somebody like me, not the salesperson that I mentioned. And how representative this is, uh, we want to try this with real world network traces. That's what we did. And uh, based on this trace, uh, we, we had to run the larger scale sort of a simulation. As I said, depending on how many mobile devices access points served, uh, you, you, you are going to spend more time to wait for uh, response from access points. In that case, you're going to consume more power. So uh, you have to have a, sort of the uh, <coughs> scenario why you are changing number of users, whether it's small network, large network, you have to look at that. All right, so first the uh, packet detection performance. In other words, how accurately you can detect uh, the, uh, your name being called in subconscious mode. <coughs> what we do that we use this USRP nodes and we change the signal to noise ratio and clock rates. 
And uh, as you can see here, the, uh, this uh, inbound signal to noise ratio, uh, horizontal axis, vertical axis is uh, the uh, misdetection probability, this side is uh, force alarm probability. We have to look at both, uh, essentially the force positive and force negatives. And uh, as you can see, if the uh, signal to noise ratio is, uh, say, <coughs> uh, better than about 8 dB or so, then these uh, immediately, uh, you can see down clock uh, by uh, a factor of 4, 8, and 16. These are all clustered here. And uh, th this <coughs> uh, indicates the uh, down clock by a factor of 16. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the more down clocking you do, uh, actually uh, you are going to have a more uh, misdetection probability or false alarm, like you, you, you can expect. Also, the, uh, if environment is bad, uh, same thing will happen. But you know, in general, uh, if you have 8 dB or higher, uh, misdetection probability is just about 1%. Definitely you can say less than 2%, which is as good as uh, just the existing Wi-Fi. Uh, existing Wi-Fi is here, the uh, square right there, right? And you can say similar things for this uh, force alarm. If it's uh, better than 8 dB on the right-hand side, uh, this immediately is as good as just regular Wi-Fi. There's a single link. I think there isn't any other thing, just a single link between the access point and the one mobile device. Uh, what about multiple links? You have one access point and then <coughs> multiple mobile devices are located at different places. This is uh, the uh, uh, layout of the fourth floor our department building at University of Michigan. And the reason why we did this, uh, because of uh, different locations, you have uh, uh, good line of sight or bad line of sight, and uh, you know also the uh, actual data rate and also the uh, signal to noise ratio would be a function of the distance between access point and mobile device. That's what we try to do. And also, the, uh, we want to measure uh, the effects of mobility. So we move the one node, like <coughs> the D, uh, this was moving. Uh, you know, my student was carrying this at the uh, USRP node, uh, walking around. Whereas all the others just stationary. And then again, we measured this uh, misdetection and the force um, alarm probability. Uh, as I showed in the previous slide, still this evenly with uh, the uh, town clocking uh, <coughs> by factor of four or sixteen looks uh, pretty good. Actually, most of the time is you know, the around or below two percent, and there's a four cell alarm probability is the same thing. Okay, what about the uh, total energy savings? As I said, <coughs> we uh, use the actual sort of network traces, and then we use these uh, as input for simulation while changing uh, the number of users on the same access point. Uh, the small network with the seven users, a large network with more than 30 users. The more users you have, uh, <coughs> actually uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, e energy savings uh, will be uh <coughs> sort of the less. But anyway, uh, the smaller the case that we have, but <coughs> the, this a fraction of uh, users having this kind of uh, the savings. But the, uh, the larger, I think on average, the, the larger network case, you can save a lot. On average, uh, we can have 40% of energy savings. What about the other uh, performance issues? Uh, we implement this in NS2 uh, and uh, using 
this uh, synthetic, synthetic traffic, and then we implemented uh, this opportunistic down clocking at Mac layer. And also we used the worst case of switching delay to indicate this would be a worst case sort of overhead. And also the signal to noise ratio we set to 8 dB. This is very pessimistic according to what I showed you earlier. And we consider two different applications. Uh, one is web browsing because this is delay sensitive. The other one is sort of a FTP of a large file. That is a more of a bandwidth sensitive. So we chose two different applications. And then we measure the sort of the energy savings versus actual sort of the latency. <clears throat> this by the CAM stands for the constant active mode, which is a most sort of a power consuming mode. And uh, this uh, power saving mode, the uh, traditional one, uh, as I alluded to you earlier, uh, this e mini can be incorporated with any existing one, constantly active mode or power saving mode. And if you combine uh, these constantly, constantly active mode or power saving mode uh, with uh, e mini, uh, you can save <coughs> energy significantly from, say, uh, 300 to 150, uh, that's almost a 50% savings. Uh, it says a 40% savings, you can see. And actual latency, uh, the key question is that you can, you can save the energy significantly, but you may extend this uh, responsiveness or response delay significantly, we want to check that. As you see here, uh, even though you're making 40% of the energy savings, uh, actual latency doesn't change much at all. It's a very little. What, what about the uh, these bandwidth uh, sensitive application like FTP? Uh, we are downloading 20 megabytes. And in that case, uh, the, uh, we save energy about 40%, just like the uh, web browsing application. Uh, actual throughput loss is around 5%. What about the overhead associated with the M preamble and the switching delay? Well, <coughs> the, this overhead to a data ratio will increase uh, as the data rate increases. And therefore, we plotted this as a function of a data rate <coughs> and the throughput. Uh, so as you increase a data rate, uh, <coughs> you are going to increase sort of the throughput overhead as you see it. Or uh, you may say the actual good put there rate will go down uh, as the uh, uh, actual throughput will go down as the data rate uh, increases. Uh, in conclusion, what we found that this idle listening is dominant in sort of power consumption on Wi-Fi equipped mobile devices. While this power saving mode is trying to reduce the amount of time uh, <coughs> or the, uh, the increase the sleeping time, this Emily is trying to reduce the power consumption not dealing with uh, the amount of uh, sleep. So it is complementary to a power saving mode. And uh, we found that we can save the additional 40% of energy on top of the power saving mode can provide us. I'm done, and now we're more than happy to answer questions. By the way, we made a presentation of this paper uh, at last year's Mobicom.
And uh, in fact, these people are selected as the best people. And uh, right now, the, uh, there are a couple of serious uh, the, uh, companies licensing this technology. Uh, by the way, we filed a patent when we submit the paper. And a week before presentation, University of Michigan has a press release. So we, we have articles in Wall Street journals and local television stations and zillions of them, including sort of television in uh, Japan. And uh, that, that was a little bit sort of the weird because I never liked that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, uh, it is very likely that this will be uh, implemented in your cell phone if you end up with uh, buying these Android phones from uh, the, uh, the company who, which is trying to license this. Uh, that happens to be the number one cell phone manufacturer in the world. I'm not going to tell you which company it is. <laughs> yes? So this, this work is, is predicated on running on unmodified 802.11 hardware, which seems very practical. Hmm? How would you compare this, though, to some modified hardware? For example, a, a separate detection circuit that ran at a lower clock speed. Yes, they can do that. Too. As I said, if I don't want to modify a chip, all I have to do is change the firmware. But instead of changing firmware, I'm going to redesign the chip. Yes, you can do that. So why weren't these uh, discovered when we designed the chips in the first place? Uh, well, the, uh, because they premised that if you down clock, you won't be able to detect these, uh, this uh, signal. You can, right? Because that's a fundamental limit imposed by Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem. That's the reason why they designed their circuit as they are. And we came up with a solution that you don't have to. Now you can redesign circuit uh, allowing this down clocking. And another question you may ask is that can we really down clock these uh, Wi-Fi processors? Yes, you use uh, Intel Exascale or the ARMS, all these uh, TBS or TFS sort of capability, that's a common place. So I think that is, is a non-question. That, that's already answered. And uh, you're right, if, uh, uh, if you want, well, if you have a capability of uh, designing chip for yourself and use those chips for access points on mobile devices, you might as well redesign the chip with this time clocking capability. But if you don't have that capability, you, you may want to just change the firmware. So we can provide both options. In fact, they're one of these two companies uh, uh, which are trying to license this technology. They want to redesign chip for themselves based on this. Yes? Did you uh, consider the spectrum usage <coughs> aspect of this or just power usage? Uh, no, not spectrum usage stuff. You, you agree that uh, you, uh, by stretching the preamble, uh, you inevitably congest the network a little bit. Uh -huh. But how much is a little bit? That's an interesting question. We haven't paid attention to the aspect, although I've been working with current radio uh, spectrum sort of uh, the usage or reuse quite a bit, but not in this context. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So it seems like equivalently to doing this, you know, convolving of multiple copies of this preamble, you could have just sent the same bit in multiple clock cycles and, you know, gotten around, you know, to get around this Nyquist. Um, sampling problem. You could have just sent the same bit multiple times, and then you wouldn't have you know, equivalent, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's exactly the same idea, though. So why, you know, so why do the self-correlation, you know, con convolution when you could have just? It seems much easier to do that, right? Uh, well, the the if it's a self-correlation, as I said, that the uh, that would be approximately the same as the signal energy. And, and then this uh, signal energy typically is used uh, to <coughs> figure out the, uh, the uh, probability of a detection uh, against the, sort of the noise floor. 
Sure. Uh, that's the reason why we use the self-correlation. I think our idea is very similar between what you said and what we did. Yeah? yeah? So, Carl, uh, does your system require everybody to uh, use the, the new? No. That, so that's why it's the compatibility. Okay, so what about the system? Does it hurt the one that doesn't change to the emailing? Oh, so you know, for example, the uh, if I have this cell phone with the evenly equipped sort of uh, the chip, uh, <clears throat> I am going to say uh, an area covered by a particular access point. Uh, <clears throat> when I establish a sort of association, I say I am a member of evenly family. If access point is not equipped to email capability, it may not know what the heck I'm talking about, right? But you do hear my signal because the CSMA you know, protocol, right? You have listened before you detect signal strength, all this. And then the, uh, this access point will ignore. It's, it's not going to hear me, but I mean, it's not going to hear the content of what I'm saying. I'm emailing away. It doesn't understand what I'm saying, although there is a signal it knows, right? And as soon as I know that it, it doesn't uh, recognize me as an email member, but recognize as a device, uh, then I think I'll, I'll do as such, and the access point will ignore whatever the uh, email preamp and the end preamp I attach. On the other hand, if it is an email equipped access point, ah, you know, you, you are the same kind as I am. And I'll give you, you know, physical address. You are one zero one zero one zero whatever, right? Yeah. And then I think you have a sort of the uh, right sort of protocol. But if I'm a, if the access point is emailing, and but I'm not emailing. Ah. So. Uh, in that case, that's easy. Do I get uh, hurt? No, 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 no. When I, you know, the uh, request the association with access point and the access point knows that I'm not email member, he's not going to assign me a uh, random sequence. It's not going to. So it's not going to send the sort of a, the M preamble attached to either because it's no use. This should be done during the association process. By the way, a lot of these questions uh, raised by these uh, Wi-Fi chip designers, they, they are very familiar with uh, these, uh, the Ableton 11 protocols inside out. I learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot of this. And the chip designers know a lot more than I do, I found out. They ask uh, really quality questions. Uh, also, they ask other questions like the automatic you know, AGC you know, selection, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that was sort of an eye-opening experience. You know, we, as a researcher, we just come up with this new idea and feel good about it and write this. And if uh, some engineers try to implement this in real product, they have to look at all these core details and raise interesting questions. I, I was very educational. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Let's thank Professor Shaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you.